Welcome back to Red Cedar Radar. Since this is kickoff week for MSU's football season, I um, have a new guest on that you have never seen before. Every week for football season, you know, coming up pretty regularly now, I am going to be having a guest on from our opposing team to kind of preview our game and give kind of a little bit of a background and a little bit of insight into our opponent. Um, This week on Friday, Michigan State faces Central Michigan University in East Lansing. So I have Adam Jaxa from Central Michigan. His official title is the voice of Central Michigan. Is that right? You got it. Voice of the Chippewas. That's what they, that's what they tell me. The perfect title. Um, <laughs> so before we get into any uh, thing about CMU and their team going forward, I want to know a little bit more about you. Can you give me a background into what you do at CMU and how you kind of got into it? Yeah, I, I basically have kind of been a leech up there in Mount Pleasant since I graduated from CMU. So uh, the the MAC signed an ESPN deal um, right after I graduated, and they they had me back pretty much right away. So I've been calling their their games up there on ESPN three for basketball and wrestling, volleyball, gymnastics, and then uh, since 2019, I've become their football and basketball radio announcer. So. Um, right now, I started full time actually with them. Uh, they made me full time in January as the voice of the chip was. I know small flex there. Let's go. And uh, so helping with all their content. So we've we've done a lot of interviews throughout fall camp, just trying to get to know the guys and the team. And uh, we're doing a lot of podcast work with the student athletes and the coaches. Um, but then also, as mentioned, we have a ton of broadcasts for ESPN three and such that we'll do throughout the year as I work with the multimedia department. Um, and then obviously getting to call the games, which is super fun. It's it's what I'm really passionate about, and obviously doesn't hurt that it's it's my alma mater. So really care about this school and a lot of great people up in Mount Pleasant. That was going to be my next question. What is your favorite part of the job? Yeah, calling games. Uh, I I just love it. I mean, it, if you can't be playing the game, then the next best thing to me was always getting a chance to tell the stories and uh, get excited about the great moments because those are the the moments that you always remember. Um, you know, wh- whatever team you cheer for, you remember those, those winning plays or those last second wins and uh, having the chance to one, meet the individuals that are, are doing all the preparations and um, putting the effort in. Um, but then to be able to, to communicate to everybody listening or watching that's relying upon uh, the broadcast team, if they're not at the game, um, to be able to listen and watch and we get to tell those stories and get excited. It's, uh, it, it's a ton of fun. And those are memories that you'll have, you know, for the rest of your life. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned before we started recording that you'll be at the game. Do you get to travel with the team always or kind of what does that look like? Yeah, if, uh, if I want to go with the team, I certainly can. I actually live in the Lansing area, so um, this is like a home game for me. It's usually an hour drive up to Mount Pleasant, but I'm <laughs> 10 minutes from, from Spartan Stadium. So I love this game. Um, and uh, yeah, there'll, there'll be flight trips. Um, so we go to South Alabama, we go to Buffalo, and we'll fly to those. But as you spend more time traveling with the team, you realize if you can get there by yourself, you can get there a lot quicker. <laughs> Uh, so we have a lot of bus trips to, you know, the mid American conference schools like ball state or Kent state and stuff. So typically I'll drive with, uh, my color commentator or, or any part of the radio crew, or maybe some of the athletic department to just get there a little quicker than, you know, hauling a hundred plus folks all in one spot. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. Understandable. Understandable. Okay. Last question kind of about your career. What would you say, this might be a big question. You can think on it. What would you say is the best game that you've ever called? Hmm. That is a good question. I will probably go recently. Um, last January, it was really cool. We had a basketball game, uh, Western Michigan's our rival and we had the toilet paper toss. It's a historic thing we used to do. Uh, the first one was like 40 years ago and our fans simply shown up and they throw toilet paper. Uh, usually it was after our first basket made, but the mid American conference, uh, put a, a bylaw in that we couldn't do that anymore. Cause it took too much time to, to clean the toilet paper and, some of the toilet paper tosses were directed at the opponent, uh, the opposing players, just 
So we brought it back and we did it before the game. So we had a sellout crowd inside McGurk Arena. Um, and it's a big game against Western. They're trailing the entire game. And I mean the entire game until about the last five seconds. They're down by two. And uh, Brian Taylor hits a three to put us up one. And then they go down, miss a shot. They rush the floor uh, with the toilet paper before Dan Marley's a, a great uh, alum. He played for the Phoenix Suns for years, was was a great all-star. He was back at the game and was part of the kind of getting the toilet paper toss kicked off because um, his son's now on the team. So that environment against your rival in a last second moment, that is uh, that is one I won't forget. And just just a fun one, which all of your fans will appreciate. We beat Michigan at the Chrysler Center in December, and that was pretty special as well. Yeah, I was going to ask if you were there just because, you know, just for giggles, if you were there or not. But you called that one. That that was pretty cool. Yeah, no awesome. doubt about it. Awesome. We should, I'm, I don't know, we should adapt that toilet paper toss. I kind of like that. Right? It's <laughs> okay. Kind of fun. It's, Moving it's, on you know, to... It's, uh, it's soft. It shouldn't hurt too bad Sorry. if it hits you. I mean, it, it was pretty cool to see it all fly right. at one time. Yeah, it's harmless. Mm hmm Okay. Moving on to CMU, I want to know more about their team. Since you've been kind of doing some more in-depth interviews and kind of getting some preseason stuff out lately, talk to me about positional breakdowns. If you can, maybe start with quarterbacks, because I think CMU is in a similar state as MSU with the quarterback race. Yeah, Sydney, uh, you're going to hear me say this a lot. These are two really similar football teams. Um, the more you look, I, I mean, maybe it's just me because I've been studying them now for like the last two months and I'm, I'm going crazy because I'm just ready for the game at this point. But they really do stack up very similar. I mean, I think for Michigan State, it's safe to say we might see both um, Hauser and Kim on Friday. I think it's very safe to say we're going to see Bauer and Emmanuel for Central Michigan. So what you're getting with our quarterbacks is uh, Burt Emanuel Jr. is the son of Burt Emanuel, who's a great NFL wide receiver. Um, there's great athleticism in that family. Uh, Burt will tell you it's not just his dad, his mom, his sisters. Like it's a, it's a very athletic family. So he's he's pretty much lightning in a bottle when he touches it and he runs. He, he could go the distance. He did that a few different times. I think he had three touchdowns of 60 or more yards on the ground last year in the small stint of four games that we saw him. So um, he's only thrown eight passes. Uh, that was something he, he got recruited more as a tight end or a safety or a wide receiver because he does have a little hitch in his throw and uh, people didn't want to make him a quarterback since he does have such a great frame. CMU, a, a smaller school, came in late, said, hey, we'll take you as a quarterback. You're going to be our most athletic guy. Um, and now he's working on that, the throwing mechanics and just being that, that type of dual threat quarterback. So we really don't know about Burt passing wise. Um, we know about his legs. If he can put the passing together, they've got a stud at quarterback on the other side, Jace Bauer, he he's a competitor, uh, great athlete, played baseball and football, uh, won a state championship in football in Ankeny, Iowa. Also took uh, the baseball program to the state championship uh, where they fell just a touch short, but um, really competitive kid. He'll, he'll lower his shor shoulder as a quarterback, which I don't know if the coaches like, cause they're, they're going to need him. Um, but he's a guy that has a little bit more experience throwing the football last year. Um, did get into some trouble. I think a, a touchdown, five interceptions, but the whole offense kind of cohesively struggled last year. So ultimately the quarterbacks did as well, but Two good options. I'd say Jace Bauer is a little bit more accurate to this point, um, but Bert Emanuel potentially has that breakaway talent where if if he starts to show that he can throw the ball consistently, he's going to be a tough guy to beat at the starting position. Well, that's exciting. I like that it's still kind of up in the air for both teams because pregame while I'm sitting up in the stands will be, you know, an exciting time to find out mm -hmm. as that information is leaked, who will start for both teams. Okay, moving on. Um, talk to me more about the offense in general. So you lost Lou Nichols um, to the NFL. I don't know if that's a loss. It, you know, it was the right move. But where does that leave CMU's offense now? Yeah, I mean, obviously everybody's looking at Lou Nichols um, being a loss, which it certainly is. I mean, he was the nation's leading rusher in 2021. He, he was right up there with with K-9, right? I mean, pretty cool, two of the top backs right here in the state of Michigan. But the thing is that the well-kept secret we know in Mount Pleasant 
The running back room has been stacked in Mount Pleasant for years. I mean, Cornell Jackson is in his fifth year as the running backs coach, and it's like he's got riches every single year, and it, it's the same thing this year. Marion Lukes is is ready to have uh, a breakout year. Um, he got injured last year, and really, Lukes and and Miles Bailey is the other one I'm going to tell you about. They didn't get that opportunity to kind of be the lead backs because Lou Nichols was in his last year. He was kind of dealing with some injuries. Um, so they had some moments, but then both Bailey and Lukes also got injured. Miles Bailey broke his wrist when he got his first start against Akron. Lukes comes in, I think in that game, he had like 257 all purpose yards. He scored three touchdowns. It was his breakout game. So you get both those guys back that I think arguably might be just as athletic or more athletic than Nichols. Um, again, they've been, they've had great running backs and then they added, um, a stud running back from Missouri transferred in here in the summer um, in uh, BJ Harris that's coming in. So I, they feel really good about the backs that they have. It really was the offensive line that kind of broke down. They didn't get good wide receiver play last year. So you put all the pieces together and that's why the offense didn't run smoothly. So that'll be the big thing this year. Can the offensive line get back to the way that they were in 2021 and, and 2019 as well? Do you have any insights into that? What's your prediction as far as that point? Yeah, I, I think the offense as a whole is going to be much improved. Um, and, and it starts with that offensive line. That's that's the, the spot that CMU has churned out professional talent for years. They just had two guys that went pro in 2021 on, on the two tackles that they replaced. The big thing, they lost their uh, offensive line coach, Mike Cummings, who had been at Central Michigan in five different stints. He left after 2021, so they had to replace him in 2022. Didn't seem like the new offensive line coach really meshed uh, with kind of the history and, and everything last year, so they had a setback there. Well, they've now swung Tavita Thompson over to the offensive line coach. He's been at Central Michigan for six years. He was the tackles and tight ends coach. Now he takes over as the O-line coach. He's a former offensive lineman himself. He gets the, they, they call him the Bubs up in Mount Pleasant. He gets that Bubs tradition. So I really do think, because you have the same pieces that were there in 2021 and in 2022, they added a couple of pieces here in 2023. But it, for the most part, it's the same guys and there's talent there. So I, I think that hunger to, to, to be great again and that physicalness that Central Michigan football has been built on for years will be back this year with Tavita Thompson. I know the guys really respect him. And I think just that, being able to establish the line of scrimmage, being able to run the football, easing up um, the pressure a little bit on these newer quarterbacks um, and, and being balanced. That's the one thing Coach Mack has preached, an offensive guy, a former quarterback himself, We've got to be balanced on offense. They were in 2019. They were in 2021. They weren't the two years they struggled, 2020 and 2022. So they get back to that balanced attack, which starts with the offensive line. They could have a really good season. Okay. Yeah. Switching gears from the offense to the defense, I was doing some reading and it seems like it's a pretty veteran squad. Correct me if I'm wrong about that, but give me some points about the defense. How are they looking? Yeah, you, you nailed it. I mean, the, the defense brings back, you know, 90% of the production from last year. The problem was you look at the numbers last year, there was there was some good, but they, I think they were on the field for so long. Um, they didn't win many games, obviously. But yes, it, it starts up front with Robbie Stewart um, and, and Quezzy Bristol. Those are your two defensive tackles that sit in the middle. Believe it or not, Sydney, uh, Robbie Stewart played in that Michigan State Central Michigan game in 2018. Uh, he sacked Brian or uh, he sacked Brian Lewerke. I just watched the highlight the other day and I couldn't believe it. But this is his seventh year with COVID and a couple of injuries. Um, so he brings back that veteran leadership. And then very similar to Michigan State, that uh, you you can argue their strength is their front seven defensively. It's the same thing for CMU. Um, you've got two great linebackers. Uh, for Michigan State, even more. Um, you've got two great linebackers and even more for Central Michigan and Kyle Moretti and Justin Whiteside. Um, and they've got a ton of, ton of depth. Um, you, you look at linebacker, it's it's right up there with running backs as the best position group on this Central Michigan team. So you start with the front seven. Since I've been covering CMU football over the last decade, uh, they've always been able to stop the run because they always have great run stoppers on the defensive front. And then you go to the back end um, and you bring back Dante Kent, who was a first team all Mac selection last year. 
a captain and uh, veteran safety and Trey Jones. So they've got pieces this year. The question marks will be on the ends. Uh, you've got Michael Heltman, who had kind of a breakout season last year. He fought, it, fought a shoulder injury, but um, he comes back with that experience. And then you've got a, a true sophomore on the other side that will be, be getting reps and Kate Custis for the first time this year. So as you know, ends, you got to get the pressure to the quarterbacks, affect the the field of play. That's going to be a big, um, big stickler this year for CMU. Can they get pressure with those youngsters on the edge? Yeah, well, I'm curious to know how our young quarterbacks, or not young, new quarterbacks, I guess, to the starting position, will deal with such a veteran squad. I mean, seven years playing college football, you have to know everything by that point. Um so that will be an interesting matchup just to see how they face off with guys that have been doing it for such a long time. So that's interesting. I didn't know that he had been around for seven years. <laughs> yeah, the COVID year and, and a couple uh, injury yeah. seasons, that'll do it. But yeah, I, I think that's why a lot of people are predicting this to be a lower scoring game because mm -hmm. typically the defense is going to be ahead of the offense anyway. But the fact right. that you're breaking in new quarterbacks and the front sevens are so good on each side, wouldn't be surprised if, if this is indeed like a lower scoring games in the, in the 20s. Yeah, definitely. Um, there was something else that popped into my mind as you were talking. Oh, as you have been kind of doing some preseason stuff with the guys and getting to know them a little bit better, what are their thoughts about the MSU game? Any chatter about how they think it's going to go or how they're feeling about coming and playing, you know, at Spartan Stadium? Give me some points there, maybe. Yeah, I think they're excited. Uh, we do have a lot of local Michigan guys. Um, that's that's kind of been the tradition of CMU when they have good teams. A lot of their roster is from Michigan. And specifically, uh, we got brothers on this team, Ethan and Evan Boyd. Um, Evan is uh, just come up to, to Central Michigan, and Ethan is has been at Michigan State for a couple of years. Um, so that's kind of a cool tie, but there's, there's other Lansing guys that are on this central Michigan team and just in the state of Michigan in general. So they typically are, are one, they get these opportunities to play power five opponents, you know, at the beginning of the year, and they love these opportunities. They went to Oklahoma state last year before that was Missouri Penn state was on the, uh, was on the schedule last year. So it, it really is a great opportunity for guys that maybe feel, uh, pun intended here, have a little chip on their shoulder, they can showcase their skills and why they belong, you know, at the power five level. So I, I think they really do get up for it. I know there'll be probably 65, 70,000 plus at, at Spartan stadium on, on Friday night. It's under the lights. It's the hundredth year there at Spartan stadium. So they're excited. Uh, they also know that Michigan state's a good football team and this will be a challenge. And it's, it's not easy one to stay in one of these games, but two, to go win one of these games, but it certainly helps. They know the history too of, of this series. CMU's walked in there three times and won. So um, when you have sort of that history and can see, hey, other teams that were just like this have done this before, I think that helps knowing, hey, why not us? Why can't we go compete with these guys and, and give them our best shot too? Yeah, well, I feel like I'm not a football coach. I've never been a football coach, but I feel like if you're coaching a team to go to a larger stadium like that, that's what you have to say. Like, why not us? Why couldn't it be us? You can't go in with the air of like, oh, it's a bigger place. It's a bigger school. Cause then you're just setting yourself and your team up for failure. So I think that's the way and kind of the message that you have to send no matter what. And obviously it has worked for CMU in the past. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, anything else that you want to say about positions um, at all or anything that, you know, the, the makeup of the team before we kind of move on? Yeah, I think the the big thing for CMU, they're, they're going to fly under the radar here, um, but they made they made coaching changes. And I think that's really going to impact specifically on the offensive side of the football. Um, we talked about it with Tavita Thompson moving from the tackles and tight ends to the offensive line coach. Paul Petrino was also the quarterback's coach last year. Um, they moved him to, to coach wide receivers, which is a position group he's very familiar with. Um, he's coached it both at the NFL and collegiate level. And the wide receivers really struggled last year. So they moved him over. They've been much more disciplined and kind of on schedule in fall camp. So I think they feel a lot more comfortable there. And then I really like Jake Costner. He's a, he's a young quarterback's coach that they brought in. I think he's only 26 years old and he was on Central Michigan staff in 2019 under Charlie Fry, who was the offensive coordinator, when CMU turned it around from one win in 2018 and went all the way to the MAC title game. 
went down to Texas, then went over to D2, turned around a limestone team, and now he's back to help kind of rebuild this program. So I don't know what it is, but he's been able to help turn things around. And I think Jim McElwain has this new um, resurgent energy here where they were really bummed out with how last year went after how good 2021 was. And I feel like he thinks not only does he have the, the right player personnel in place, but he's got the right coaches as, as well. Yeah, I like that. And at MSU, we have been going through, obviously, a new change. Not, I say we, I'm not on the team. They have been going through a new change with Mel Tucker coming on and the staff kind of all turning over and everything. So you saying that and then bringing in some young guys with some new energy is relatable because I feel like that's the way that college football is going now. You need new perspectives because kind of just like recruiting and everything else that my listeners are like, oh, she's talking about recruiting again. But that is that landscape is that landscape is changing. I feel like the coaching landscape needs to keep up with that. And sometimes things are slow to change in kind of the coaching room just because guys have been around for so long and you want to keep them around because you're loyal to them. But sometimes that new guy energy really brings something that the team has been missing that maybe you didn't know was missing before. Okay, moving on from MSU versus CMU, tell me a little bit more about the rest of CMU's season and if you have any predictions on how things will go. Yeah, I uh, I don't know if you've looked at CMU's opponents, but uh, I know how much traction Michigan State is getting about how difficult their schedule is, rightfully so. Unfortunately, CMU is in that exact same boat. Uh, one, after they play Michigan State, yay, they get their first home game against an FCS opponent. Well, it's New Hampshire who won their conference last year and made it to the second round of their playoffs. So that's not an easy one. Then you got to go to South Bend to take on Notre Dame, who just throttled Navy and looks like they've got uh, a juggernaut in, in Sam Hartman there. And then you go to South Alabama, who won, I think, nine or ten games last year. They came up and beat CMU. They won the Sun Belt last year. So that's your non-conference and then you get into the MAC, uh, which CMU is trying to win for the first time since 2009. So despite what I just told you, I honestly feel really good about CMU's chances to, to get back to the MAC championship game for the first time since 2019. I, I really do, um, like I had mentioned, think that uh, Jim McElwain, they kind of recentered themselves after a tough year last year, kind of looked themselves in the mirror and said, hey, we're, we're better than this. We let folks down. And here's what we need to correct things. And I think they made those corrections. And on top of it, uh, Sydney, it's his fifth year. So he's got his recruits in there. He's got um, the talent that has started to come through. They had the, the number one recruiting class signed in the MAC this past year. So I feel like this is their most talented group. They just need one of these teams to put it together. It feels like it'll be them or Toledo out of the West. Toledo, the defending MAC champs. They bring back to Quan Finn from, from Detroit. Um, but CMU gets them at home and, uh, they get the three teams. They were picked fourth in the West, um, after a struggle some year last year, but the three teams that were picked ahead of them, Eastern and Northern Illinois and Toledo, they all have to come to Kelly short stadium where under Jim McElwain in good years, which has been odd years like this, um, they've been really good at home. So if they string it together and the offensive coaching changes make the difference, I think they will. I think this team's going to play some meaningful football in November and have a chance to to get back to Detroit to compete for that MAC championship. Well, that's very exciting. I do have to ask, are you like me? Do you usually err on the side of like, this is the season, this is it? Or are you more level-headed than I am? I mean, I try to be level-headed, but I, I am an alum and I, I am <laughs> rooting for these guys, you know, in the depths of my heart. But yes, I, I try and see it from a neutral perspective. Um, <laughs> yeah. I do my best, but you know, the emotions, they get in the way sometimes. I understand completely. Well, it has been a pleasure having you on and maybe we will see you again kind of after the game to recap how things went. Um, MSU takes on CMU on Friday at 7 p.m. in Spartan Stadium. You can watch it on Fox Sports 1. Um, and this podcast will be available on YouTube or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Um, if you head to our YouTube page, subscribe and check out Spartans Illustrated for more pregame and postgame coverage of MSU football. Thanks so much for joining. I appreciate you very much. Um, and we'll see who is quarterback and how the game shakes out. And I will have another, another episode kind of postgame recapping thoughts on Saturday.